We're talking about hyperprolactinemia in this lesson. So we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So if we actually look at the word hyperprolactinemia, hyper means high, prolactin refers to the hormone prolactin, and emia means condition in the blood. And that is exactly what this is. It is a medical condition involving high levels of prolactin in the blood. Prolactin is one of the hormones produced and released from the anterior pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is a small gland located in your head and it is below the hypothalamus. It receives inputs from the hypothalamus including stimulatory and inhibiting hormones. We're going to talk a bit more about this later on in this lesson. So again, prolactin is a hormone produced in the anterior pituitary. It's produced by cells in the anterior pituitary known as lactotrophs. And prolactin itself is involved in multiple functions, including lactation. And the condition of hyperprolactinemia occurs in roughly 1% of the general population. Now, how is prolactin regulated? Its release is regulated by dopamine. Dopamine actually inhibits the release of prolactin. And the release of prolactin is actually upregulated by thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. TRH comes from the hypothalamus. And prolactin itself inhibits GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which itself actually acts on the anterior pituitary gland to release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are important in gonadal functioning. Now, I mention all of these here because they will be important in recognizing what causes hyperprolactinemia and what some of the consequences of hyperprolactinemia are. So, again, dopamine inhibits prolactin release, TRH or thyrotropin releasing hormone upregulates prolactin and prolactin itself inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. So now let's talk about some of the causes of hyperprolactinemia. So there are physiological causes of transient increases in prolactin levels. Again, as I mentioned before, they are transient. So they are only temporary. Some of them include exercise. So exercise can lead to elevated levels of prolactin. Lactation, as we mentioned before, prolactin is a very critical regulator of lactation. So lactation itself increases prolactin levels. Pregnancy also leads to higher levels of prolactin. And sleep, so during sleep, prolactin levels will increase. Physical stress can also increase prolactin levels, and then sexual activity also can increase prolactin levels. So these are physiological causes of hyperprolactinemia. But these causes are temporary in nature. So they're not going to cause some of these signs and symptoms we're going to see later on in this lesson. They are temporary and they have physiological rules. Now the problem occurs with these pathophysiological causes. These include pituitary conditions, having a prolactinoma, which is a benign tumor of lactotrophs, so more of those cells that produce prolactin. If we have a proliferation of those cells, they can produce more prolactin, leading to too much prolactin or hyperprolactinemia. Other conditions that can also have higher levels of prolactin include acromegaly, so having a pituitary adenoma that can lead to acromegaly can also cause hyperprolactinemia as well. Cushing's disease is also another pituitary condition that can have related hyperprolactinemia. Another pathophysiological cause of hyperprolactinemia is hypothyroidism. And the reason being is that hypothyroidism, and more specifically primary hypothyroidism, can lead to increased levels of thyrotropin-releasing hormone, or TRH. And as we mentioned before, TRH can increase the release of prolactin, or increase levels of prolactin. So... In hypothyroidism, we're going to have low thyroid hormone levels, and the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary gland are going to increase their release of their respective hormones. With regards to the hypothalamus, it is thyrotropin-releasing hormone, and with regards to anterior pituitary, it's going to be thyroid-stimulating hormone. So we're going to see higher levels of TRH in primary hypothyroidism. Now, Prolactin itself is cleared from the body through the kidneys and also metabolized by the liver. So having renal failure or kidney failure and having liver failure can also lead to higher levels of prolactin. So if we have renal failure, we're going to have reduced clearance of prolactin. 
And with liver failure, we're going to have a reduced metabolism of prolactin. So both of these are going to lead to higher levels of prolactin, so hyperprolactinemia. Certain medications can also lead to hyperprolactinemia. This is very important to recognize. Medications, specifically anti-dopaminergic medications. So as we mentioned before, dopamine inhibits prolactin. If we inhibit dopamine, we're inhibiting an inhibitor. So we're actually going to lead to higher levels of prolactin. So anti-dopaminergic medications can lead to higher levels of prolactin. So some of these anti-dopaminergic medications include antipsychotics and antidepressants. Now we can also see certain other medications leading to increased levels of prolactin. These include antihypertensives, and one example is rapamil. Anticonvulsants can also lead to higher levels of prolactin, and an example is phenytoin. And antiemetics can also cause elevated levels of prolactin. These include metoclopramide and domperidone. And these antiemetics cause hyperprolactinemia because they are dopamine antagonists. And certain opioids can also lead to elevated prolactin levels as well. And then we can also see H2 or histamine 2 blockers like cimetidine and ranitidine. These can also lead to hyperprolactinemia as well. So as you can see, a lot of different causes of hyperprolactinemia, but we separate them out, physiological and pathophysiological. Physiological, again, are temporary, and they're not going to cause some of the signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the next slide. Now let's talk about the clinical features of hyperprolactinemia. So it all has to do with increased prolactin functioning. And because prolactin is critically involved in lactation, we may have galactorrhea occurring. So galactorrhea is a milk discharge. So because there's so much prolactin, it can act on the mammary glands to produce milk, and this can lead to galactorrhea. And this is going to occur in women, although it may very, very rarely occur in men. Now, more specifically, what can occur in men is gynecomastia. So gynecomastia is an increased enlargement of breast tissue in men. So those signs and symptoms can occur due to increased prolactin functioning. Now, we mentioned before, prolactin can inhibit gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and that's going to have effects on gonadal functioning. So hyperprolactinemia can lead to hypogonadism. Some of the symptoms of hypogonadism include oligomenorrhea and amenorrhea, so having less than nine menstrual cycles per year or having no menstrual cycles for six months can be a sign of hyperprolactinemia. Because there are issues with menstrual cycles, there can be issues with infertility. So this can be another feature of hyperprolactinemia. In men, we can see erectile dysfunction. So there's issues with gonadotropin releasing hormone and some of those other anterior pituitary hormones. So we're going to have issues with erectile functioning. We can also see decreased libido and decreased energy and fatigue due to decreased testosterone. Now, hyperprolactinemia can have other features as well. Some of these include visual disturbances. Now, you might be wondering why this happens. So the reason being is because the tumor, that benign tumor we mentioned as a potential cause of hyperprolactinemia, so a benign tumor of lactotrophs, it can grow to a size where it may actually start to impinge or compress the optic chiasm. So this can actually lead to field cuts, can lead to issues with oftentimes peripheral vision. So there may be bitemporal hemianopsia. So this can occur with patients who have hyperprolactinemia. And what is taught most often is that we're going to see this more in men. The reason being is because women who have hyperprolactinemia often present earlier than men. And the reason for that is because they have issues with their menstrual cycle. So because they have issues with their menstrual cycle, they're going to present to healthcare earlier than men, and they're going to have been worked up before the tumor grows to a significant size. With men, some of the findings of hyperprolactinemia are very subtle, perhaps decreased energy, perhaps decreased libido, and that tumor of lactotrophs may grow in size. It may grow large enough where it can actually impinge and compress the optic chiasm. So because men present later to healthcare, they're going to more likely have visual disturbances. They're going to more likely have a large enough pituitary adenoma where it's going to cause this type of visual field defect. 
and we're going to see it more often with macro adenomas and the definition of a macro adenoma is greater than one centimeter in size. Now, along with this, we can see headaches being another symptom of hyperplactinemia and decreased bone mass can also occur as well. This is due to lower levels of testosterone and estrogen due to that lower gonadal functioning. So again, visual disturbances we're going to more often see in men with macro adenomas because they present later and we're also going to see headaches and decreased bone mass being other findings that can occur in hyperplactinemia as well. So how is hyperplactinemia diagnosed and treated? So diagnosis of hyperplactinemia involves blood work. Now it's important to identify possible causes of hyperplactinemia, such as medications we talked about before. So it's very important to actually identify some of those causes prior to blood work and possibly changing those medications. So with regards to blood work, serum prolactin level measurements are important and TSH levels are important to measure as well. As I mentioned before, primary hypothyroidism can lead to elevated thyrotropin releasing hormone levels or TRH levels, which can also then lead to elevated TSH levels. So it's important to check TSH levels in order to indirectly assess whether there is increased TRH levels that may be causing increased release of prolactin. And then as I mentioned before, it's important to assess for other conditions and causes. And for imaging, MRI of the head can also be performed specifically looking at the cella tersica area to assess for a prolactinoma that could be causing hyperprolactinemia. Once a clinician has diagnosed this condition, how is it treated? So as I mentioned before, identifying the cause is very, very important. So identifying the cause and treating the cause. If it is medications, potentially change those medications. If it is some other cause that we've talked about before, it's also important to look at and assess and treat that cause. If it's hypothyroidism, that's important to treat as well. So again, an example of treating a cause is cessation of a certain medication. Dopamine agonists can also be utilized as well. So long-acting dopamine agonists are the preferred choice, and these include bromocryptine and cabergoline. And then surgery in some cases. So again, blood work is important to look at prolactin levels and TSH levels and to assess for other conditions and causes as well. Some of those include renal failure and liver disease. And then MRI of the head is also important to look for a prolactinoma. Treatment has to do with identifying and treating the cause. Dopamine agonists can also be utilized as well. These include long-acting dopamine agonists such as bromocryptine and capricoline, and surgery can be performed in some cases. If you want to learn more about other endocrinology conditions, please check out my endocrinology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.